Hi everyone, we're going to talk about EDTA in this video. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, EDTA. And I'd like to sketch the chemical structure. We are sort of familiar with this ethylene diamine portion of the molecule. Remember, ethyl meant two carbons. Diamine meant that we have those two amine groups, but I'm not going to draw the hydrogens there because I have to add these acetic acid groups. There's going to be four of them, two on this nitrogen and two on this nitrogen. So here's the first acetic acid. Here's the second. The third. and the fourth. Notice that I've drawn all of these acetic acid groups as protonated, and I could do the same for this nitrogen. Notice that this nitrogen has three bonds, meaning that there would be a lone pair here, but if I were to protonate it, it would have four bonds, giving it a positive charge. So I'm going to do that to this other nitrogen. Again, if I put a hydrogen here, that means it'll have four bonds, giving it a positive charge. So what we have here is the fully protonated form of EDTA, and we can think of it as H6A, but when we talk about EDTA, we use the symbol Y. And H6Y would have a plus 2 charge, again, coming from these fully protonated nitrogen atoms. This is the fully protonated form of EDTA. It's a hexaprotic weak acid capable of donating six protons, a hexaprotic weak acid. Well, big deal. This fully protonated form cannot bind metals if all of the binding sites are protonated. We are therefore interested in the unprotonated form, which I've shown here. Now, all of these oxygen atoms would be surrounded by an octet, the proton would be gone, and therefore, each oxygen atom here would have a negative charge. And notice that we're back to nitrogen having three bonds, so you would have a lone pair. So this unprotonated form of EDTA we would call Y minus 4. And this unprotonated form is the form that we care about because it's the form that binds metals. And here is a structure showing a metal EDTA complex. Notice that metal ion is in the center, and notice that octahedral geometry surrounding that metal ion. And it's really tough to look at, but you can probably follow how EDTA wraps itself around that metal ion. Look at this part, this ethylene diamine part. And you can see you've got your nitrogen atom, there's that ethyl, and then another nitrogen atom. And then off of that nitrogen, here's your acetic acid, and here may be this unprotonated oxygen donating electrons to that metal ion. Here is that metal EDTA complex. In a typical problem, it may be a titration problem where you've got some formal concentration of EDTA, and in the Erlenmeyer, maybe we've got some metal, maybe it's calcium. So you would write down the complex formation reaction between calcium and the unprotonated form of EDTA because that's the form that binds metals 
to form a calcium EDTA complex. And the formation constant you would write as products over reactants And this is what you need. This concentration of the unprotonated form is what you need, but you're never given that. You are, however, given the formal concentration of EDTA. So let's recall how in lab, didn't you use a 0 0.0030 formal EDTA solution? And wasn't that adjusted to a pH of 10? At this formal concentration, at a pH of 10, could we calculate the concentration of the unprotonated form? Well, I think we could if we used alpha. Alpha, the fraction of the unprotonated form, would be the part over the whole, so that would be the concentration of the unprotonated form over the whole, and wouldn't that just be the formal concentration? So if we rearrange for the concentration of the unprotonated form, we would have the fraction of the unprotonated form times the formal concentration. Again, we know the formal concentration. Can we somehow calculate the fraction of the unprotonated form if we know the pH? And we can. It's an awful looking equation though. If you think back to the fraction of A minus two, do you remember that from your notes? Well, the fraction of y minus 4 is going to be similar, but it's going to get ugly. In the numerator, we'll have Ka1 times Ka2 times Ka3 times Ka4 times Ka5 times Ka6. And what are these the Ka's for? These are the Ka's for EDTA, which, don't forget, is a hexaprotic weak acid. So these are the Ka values. Downstairs is where things get really ugly. We have H plus to the sixth plus K1. If you don't mind, I'd rather just say K1 instead of Ka1 times H plus to the fifth plus K1, K2, times H plus to the fourth, plus, I think you get the pattern now, K1, K2, K3, times H plus to the third, and maybe I'll let you finish the rest of these terms here. You take a minute to write them, and I'll write them down too. Did you get the same thing I got? Did you get this pattern here? So how would you like to plug in all of these Ka values into this equation, knowing that the hydrogen ion concentration at a pH of 10 would be 1 times 10 to the negative 10th. It would be terrible, and it would be a terrible thing to have to do on a test. But I worked through it, and in the numerator here, I got 2.03 times 10 to the negative 22nd, and then I'll write down what I got for all of these terms in the denominator. So if you were to do all of this arithmetic, maybe you would get the same thing. I hope you would, but then you could say, finally, after plugging and chugging until the sun doesn't shine anymore, you would get alpha is equal to 0 0.30, and then finally, you could come back up here and say, well, the concentration of the unprotonated form in that solution that you used in lab, at a, which had a pH of 10, was 0 
times that formal concentration, and you'd get 9.0 times 10 to the negative fourth molar y minus 4. But that was so much work. Look at the tedious nature of these calculations. Again, even if you're given all of these KAs, how would you like to do this on a test? I would hate to do it. But if you think about it, we've already done it at a pH of 10. At a pH of 10, we would never, ever, ever have to do this calculation again. So what Harris has done is he calculated alpha at commonly used pHs, and he provided them in a table. Here it is. Here are very commonly used pHs, and here are the values for alpha, the fraction of the unprotonated form. And notice that I got the same thing that Harris got. So you will never have to do this terrible calculation. If you want to know the concentration of the unprotonated form, yes, you'll have to say that that equals alpha times the formal concentration. But you'll be able to look up alpha in this table. What a relief. So let's talk about how we can use alpha in our calculations. So here's that complex formation reaction. We could begin by saying that Kf, as always, is products over reactants. And again, the concentration of the unprotonated form is never, ever given. But we know that the concentration of the unprotonated form is equal to alpha, the fraction of the unprotonated form, times the formal concentration of EDTA. And that is something that is always given. So I'm going to plug in this expression for y minus 4 right here. And what does that yield? Kf is going to be the concentration of the complex over the calcium ion concentration. And again, for y minus 4, I'm going to write alpha times the formal concentration. So what's nice about this is we've gone from an expression that contains a quantity that's never given to a quantity, like we said before, that's always given. You're always given the formal concentration of EDTA. If we multiply both sides by alpha, we get alpha times Kf equals the concentration of the complex over the calcium ion concentration times the formal concentration of EDTA and the product of alpha times Kf is called K primed of F, which is the conditional formation constant. So again, we've gone from an expression that contains a quantity that's never given to us to a quantity that's always given and all we'll have to do is look up alpha in a table. So the beauty of the conditional formation constant is that it allows us to treat complex formation as though there were only one form of EDTA. So we can write our complex formation reaction as this. Calcium reacts with EDTA to form a complex and then the conditional formation constant will be the concentration of the complex over the calcium ion concentration and the formal concentration of EDTA. Let's get some practice using the conditional formation constant. Here, they're asking us to find the conditional formation constant for this complex at two different pHs. And I'm thankful that I have this table that I can just simply look up the values for alpha. So at a pH of 4, K primed of F 
would be alpha times kf. Alpha at a pH of 4 is just this, 3.0 times 10 to the negative 9th. And now I'm going to need kf. Well, Harris provides the log of kf for so many different metal ions that you can see. Here is the one that we're interested in. So if he gives you log of kf to get kf, you'll just have to take the anti-log of this number. And when I did it, I got 3.16 times 10 to the 16th. Notice how huge that is. So the conditional formation constant at a pH of 4 equals 9.49 times 10 to the 7th. And at a pH of 10, the conditional formation constant is going to be even larger because at a pH of 10, there's going to be an even larger fraction of the unprotonated form. K prime of F equals alpha times KF. Alpha at a pH of 10 was 0 0.30. K prime to KF is the same thing. And now I'm getting 9.49 times 10 to the 15th. Next, in another video, we'll be using the conditional formation constant to calculate the concentrations of free metal ions in EDTA solutions. So sorry the video was so long. I hope you listened to the whole thing, and thanks for listening.